Well, hello, everyone. Thanks for joining us this afternoon. I'm Ivo Dollar, the president of the Chicago Council on Global Affairs. Uh, thank you, especially our members, for joining us today for a conversation with Ann Applebaum. As a reminder, the Council is an independent and nonpartisan organization, and the views expressed here are those of the participants and not necessarily of the Council. Uh, today's program is on the record. A recording of the conversation will also be available on our website and will be uh, sent out on social media channels shortly after we conclude our conversation. Uh, we'll also, of course, as usual, take your questions. And if you want to ask a question or vote on a question that has already been asked, go to your browser and type in ccga.live and we'll take it uh, there in about uh, 20, 25 minutes or so. Now I'm delighted to welcome back to uh, the Chicago Council, Ann Applebaum. Ann currently writes for The Atlantic, but also wrote for The Washington Post for nearly 17 years. She also is a senior fellow at the Agora Institute at Johns Hopkins University. Ann Applebaum is a Pulitzer Prize winning historian with particular expertise in the histories of communist and post-communist Europe. She's written a new book called Twilight of Democracy, The Seductive Lure of Authoritarianism. If you haven't already, I encourage you to purchase a copy of this fascinating read through our local Chicago book partner, The Bookseller. A direct link for purchasing uh, the book with The Bookseller is shared in the chat function here on Zoom and can also be found on our webpage. And thanks so much for joining us. It's wonderful to have you back uh, to uh, the council last time in person. Now, unfortunately, we'll have to do it from Zoom. But in, um, the other good news is you don't have to fly from, from Chicago to, uh, to Chicago to get here. Wonderful to have you. You still have your, uh, you're still muted, Anne. Um, thank you. I have, I was going to say thank you. I, I have fond memories of being at the Chicago Council when my last book came out, which was a completely different kind of book. Um, I'm glad to be here virtually and, you know, maybe next time in person. Well, we'll look forward to If you keep on writing books, we'll keep on asking you to come back. Let's start, let's start with this book. You start, uh, and in fact, end uh, uh, with a party. In fact, there are a lot of parties in, in, in this book in some ways, but uh, this is a unique party. The millennium, the change from 1999 to 2000, you have a party in, uh, in, um, in Poland where you are living at the time. Uh, you have many guests from all around the world, and some of those remain your best and, and most wonderful friends, and some of them don't. Talk a little bit about the party and why, uh, and why you're using this really as a metaphor, I think, uh, for uh, the larger theme of your book. So yes, the book does begin with a party. And yes, to be clear, this is not because I'm some kind of hostess or I give a lot of parties. That's, you know, it's, it, that really wasn't the purpose of the book, of the, of the, of the, of the anecdote. Um, it was just that this party was given in 1999, which was a moment of really huge optimism in Poland. Um, and the, at the party were a lot of people who were, I mean, it was nobody famous at the time or, you know, but a lot of junior journalists, a lot of people involved at a very low level in Polish politics, some foreigners, some people from Britain, some from, from the US. Um, but they all shared a kind of optimism about the direction that Poland was then going, the, um, the integration of Poland to the rest of Europe, um, the feeling, you know, the joining of NATO, which happened um, soon after that, um, around, around the same time. Um, and my reflection some years later was that some of the people who were there um, had chosen since then a very different path. Um, and not only that, they were bitterly at odds, not just with me, I should say, but with other guests who were at the party, and that there had been a really profound political change that had polarized the country in a very deep way. Um, and because this experience of polarization is now one that other countries know as well, the US, UK, um, really almost every, you know, you know many modern democracies, um, this struck me as important. And I began to think about, well, so who were the people and why was it that they um, chose a different path? Why did they, they, you know, so whereas most of the, you know, many, you know, we would all have been considered part of one kind of political group at the time. Some, you could call it center-right, you could call it liberal, you could call it Thatcherite, maybe at that, in that era. Um, and that group had then broken up. Um, and some of the people who were at my party then became much more radical. Um, and they are now, some of them, very prominent and senior 
journalists and spin doctors and um, uh, kind of propagandists for the Polish ruling party, which is really a radical right party that seeks to create a kind of Catholic nationalist state um, and has um, in, the, in, in recent years made real attempts to undermine some democratic institutions in Poland. So the independent courts, um, the media, um, and now maybe, maybe, maybe more. And again, I, I came up with not a single answer or a single explanation, but rather with a series of explanations as to why this change had happened. And some of them were to do with people's disappointments, either personal or political, with, with, the, with, the, um, you know, with the liberal democracy that was created in the 1990s and afterwards. Um, and and some, were, some were personal, some were, some were to do with their own personal careers. But that was the, the attempt, the, the question was, okay, so there was a group of people who were all on one side and now they're not, what happened? And that was the, that was the starting thought that led me to write the book. And so you, 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 you then, you sort of, you, you, you tell in, in many ways sort of five different stories, which are also connected. You tell the story about what happens in Poland. You talk about Hungary. You talk about Britain and Brexit and go on to Spain and the Vox movement. And of course, to the United States and, uh, and, and, and not only, not just Trump, but what happened to, uh, to the Republican party and, and the right. And each of those vignettes, which are really wonderfully told for those who've not had an opportunity to read the book, it's a incredibly readable, easily accessible uh, and, and well, uh, well, uh, well written. Uh, each of those you use for different purposes. And one of the, the, the Polish story is really about the big lie. Uh, talk a little bit about about the importance, the central importance of sort of what you call at some points uh, the big lie or the, or, or the medium big lie. I was uh, going to say, actually, the expression that I use is the medium sized lie. Um, and so this, you know, the, the so one of the one of the things that happened in Poland that was a really important political moment and moment of political change was following a really tragic um, plane crash. Uh, a decade ago, which killed the then president of Poland and also many other prominent people, including many people who I knew and, and my husband knew. Um, following that plane crash, um, some, um, some you know, journalists, um, propagandists, politicians associated with now the ruling party began to spin a very um, compelling um, conspiracy theory about why the plane had crashed. I mean, sometimes the conspiracy involved Russia, sometimes it involved the then Polish government, um, but it was, it was powerful enough to convince a lot of people in Poland that something had happened and something was being covered up. Um, and this for Americans, the parallel story is the one of birtherism in the United States. So we also had a conspiracy theory like this um, in which, you know, and by the way, I think it's not accidental that Donald Trump was one of the people pushing it, you know, it, which, which trans, um, kind of transmitted to the idea to a lot of people, about a quarter of the population, that something is illegitimate about the entire state. So in the case of Poland, you know, the implication of the theory was that everyone, the government, the parliament, the media, the bureaucracy, the diplomatic service are all covering up a terrible story about the murder of a Polish president. And that's a very deep and profound charge. Um, and it, it was used um, not in the way that old fashioned kind of big lie totalitarian ideologies were used. You know, they, it wasn't a complete description of the world, you know, with an explanation for everything and an economic theory and so on. But it was a really effective tool to undermine faith in the political system. Um, again, the, you know, the situation in the US is similar. You know, if it's true that the president of the United States is illegitimate, you know, he's a fake president and he is nevertheless being kept in place again by everybody, the bureaucracy, the, you know, the, the media, the, um, you know, then that means that the whole system is profoundly corrupt um, and needs to be changed. Um, and this message was um, very cleverly um, and very consistently propagated and spread by the Law and Justice Party and including by some people I know, including one or two who had been at my New Year's Eve party in 1999. Um, and so, again, the book tries to show what were the techniques, what were the methods, what was the, what was the, um, you know, how is change effective? And it was, you know, in, in Poland, and then there's an echo of this in other countries, um, the use of conspiracy theory um, to undermine faith in the political system, to undermine faith in 
in, in institutions um, is one of the consistent themes, I think, of the last decade um, if, in Western politics. So staying, staying a minute for this poem, because of course we just had a, a, an election there, a presidential election, which split the country right down the middle and really painted two very different pictures of the future of Poland. Uh, and and the, the ruling party uh, came out uh, on the other side in victory once once again. Talk a little bit about where uh, what this really means for, uh, for Poland. On the one hand, the depolarization, the deep division uh, between the more liberal, more open, uh, uh, view of where Poland needs to go, and the other hand, uh, uh, the fact that the other side, uh, the, the party in power, once again won. Uh, where where does this go? What does that give you in terms of thinking about the future? Is this a uh, how how worried are you about the future of democracy in Poland? And uh, put a straight point to it. Uh, but where where do you think this is uh, this is heading? So just so that people understand, it's a it's hard to describe the unpleasantness and virulence of Polish politics right now, but just as an example, one of the central issues in the campaign was a series of statements made by the current president, the sitting president, who was reelected by a slight margin, um, who said during the campaign that LGBT is not people, it's an ideology. And by the way, LGBT in Polish sounds very strange and foreign. You know, it doesn't, it's unclear even really what it means. It's an English language acronym. Um, and there was a, and this statement was echoed and kind of repeated by Polish state television, which is now controlled by the ruling party and is used by the ruling party to, um, you know, as part of its electoral propaganda. And there were repetitive shows and discussions about, you know, if the opposition wins, does that mean we won't have National Independence Day anymore? We'll only have gay pride parades. You know, does it mean the sexualization of children in schools? Will the people, children be forced um, to, to have a, some kind of foreign imposed sex education? So this theme was used. It must have been something that they would polled and it must have been something that they understood would be, would have a pickup or a, would be taken up by you know, their sort of their half of the political spectrum because they repeated it um, quite a lot. Um, and this was echoed, there were some other, you know, there was also anti-Semitic themes were used, you know, anti-foreigner themes were used. Um, the, you know, the opposition was portrayed as not really Polish. Um, they're, you know, they're German or they're foreign or they're elites or they're somehow not Polish. And the, the language that was used about them was of people who are not patriotic. Um, and that, you know, that that is that is of course a classic. I mean, we call it populist, but really it's also a kind of nationalist, authoritarian way of doing politics to define your part of the nation as the true nation and your opponents as illegitimate. So it's not as if you're both, you know, you're equally competing political parties on some kind of imaginary equal landscape or equal playing field um, in a democracy. Instead, you're the only true party. You're the only ones who deserve to have power. Um, and the opposition is illegitimate. And that is the, that is the kind of language um, that would used. And of course, once you have come to power using that kind of language, and by the way, this doesn't have to be a right wing way of winning an election. Um, you know, if you look at the kind of language Chavez used in Venezuela in the past, it's it's remarkably, you know, although it's attached to a lot of Marxist economics, it's a remarkably similar set of tactics. You know, we're the real Venezuelans, they're the, they're the you know, the, the, the imposters. But once you've come to power that way, um, then you also have, you know, you feel yourself empowered to alter the political system so that um, your true party, your patriotic party, can't lose again. Because, you know, you, you know if, if the opposition are illegitimate, then you, you know you know it would be it would be you know so bad if they win that you are then authorized um, to to do all kinds of you know to, to change the system so that you don't lose and and this is one of the things that Polish ruling party has done so they have sought to pack the courts so that there's no independent judiciary in Poland they have as I said taken over state media which is very important in Poland it's still the main media for about thirty percent of the country. Um, they have now announced their intentions to go after independent media, to force owners to sell. It's not clear yet how they're gonna do that, but that's how they're talking. Um, and there's now some hint that they may have used the security services during the election as well. So 
Um, so those are the kinds of tactics that um, that that they that they have used to undermine, um, you know, the, the the legitimacy and the 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 equality really of the of the electoral field. So, uh, I mean, the interesting thing, of course, is that in all of the cases that you describe, including the, the one we just talked about in, in terms of Poland, it is an electoral system uh, that is that sure. is being used to get to, uh, to get to power, and different instruments are being used. Uh, one of those instruments you just talked about, and and also plays a prominent role in in the discussion, not only in Hungary but in, particularly in Spain, is the media and the new media environment. Uh, and in Spain, the, the trolling, uh, what's happening in, in, in uh, terms of websites and everything else that's happening in social media. How is media being used? Uh, and if you want to talk about Spain or, or, or the United States, which is another piece where you talk about the importance of the media, how is the media environment changing? The, the discrediting, on the one hand, of, uh, of sort of the traditional media or its nationalization, uh, party or political control, or on the other hand, uh, the emergence of, of a, a very diffuse and fragmented media environment that enables uh, people to get their message to the right folks in order to, to win or at least to, to uh, get power uh, or become stronger in elections. So just to be clear, um, you know, I acknowledge, you know, for better or for worse, um, there has been an information revolution. Um, the the whatever you want to call it, the mainstream media, the legacy media, the you know the old institutions of the press um, have lost power and will not regain it. And you know my I don't have a I'm not I'm not you know the purpose of me writing about that isn't to isn't to you know to to whine about it or, or hope for them to come back. Um, I think on the contrary, we're living through a really profound information revolution that affects us on all kinds of levels. Um, you know, both it's both to do with the way we now get political news. You know, for a lot of us, it sort of appears on our phone in little, you know, in little bits sort of in between, I don't know, advertisements for hairspray and, you know, messages from our cousin. You know, it's a, it or, or it appears on our Facebook page transmitted from, you know, our friends or friends of our friends. Um, and so the way in which we're getting and seeing information has changed quite a lot. And I also think there is now a, a profound, you know, loss of trust and a sense of uncertainty about what is true and what isn't true um, that, you know, it, it, you know, it may be a long time before that can be rebuilt somehow. Um, and at the same time, we've lost a kind of sense of there being a public square. In other words, a, um, uh, you know, a, a shared space where people are arguing about the same facts where you know people might have different opinions but at least we're all focused on the same problems at the same time i mean that is really gone in most democracies there are some exceptions i should say um, but in a lot of democracies it's gone and people now ex you know they exist within their own bubbles or their own echo chambers um, they see you know the, the the material that they trust is things that come from other people that they trust and and they don't have a there isn't a you know, there isn't any central space. And there, I should say, there are many good things about the new media environment. Um, it, it's, it's, it's created fantastic opportunities for people who wouldn't have had a chance otherwise. Um, but one of the worrying things about it is that it has, um, it has, you know, it's made it very, it's made it much easier, for example, to conduct the kind of conspiratorial disinformation campaigns that we were just talking about. Um, and it also means that we've lost a, you know, we've lost a sense of public space and therefore you have, you know, the society fragmented and people um, divided much more deeply than they ever were in the past. Um, you know, so in the book I talk, I do talk a little bit about how a modern disinformation campaign is run, um, how you can set up completely fake, I should say, um, news, news websites or news looking websites um, that look like newspapers but aren't. Um, and this has been done in Spain, it's been done in Brazil, it's been done in the United States. Um, and then you can use those headlines from the fake news websites and push them using, um, using the techniques and tactics of social media. So you can use trolls and you can use fake accounts and so on. So it is possible to spread and push and propagate ideas um, using false um, sort of, you know, false mechanisms or mechanisms anyway there where you're disguising you know, who's really behind different kinds of bits of information and who's not. And this is now, you know, we all associate this, I think, in the U.S. with the Russians, because that was what the Russians were doing during the U.S. election campaign in 2016. But, I mean, this is not Russians. I mean, this is now done by everybody. 
Um, so, you know, in the U.S. right now, I mean, there's I'm, you know, no doubt still plenty of Russian involvement um, in, in American social media space, but, you know, you hardly need them now because there's so many other actors and groups seeking to do exactly the same thing and operating the same way. Um, some of the platforms have made some attempts at at least eliminating, you know, egregiously false accounts, but I mean, it, they're, they're constantly trying to catch up with the way these tactics, with the way these tactics change. So, um, you know, the, this is a, this to my mind, by the way, is something for, you know, I don't think a, a future Trump administration would deal with it, but a, a future Biden administration or, or whoever comes after that, um, this is a, to my mind, real priority is to think about how we, uh, as a nation, begin to rethink what the public sphere is going to look like. What do we want our a democratic internet to look like? How are we going to make it easier to speak to one another again? But that's a, that's a conversation for another day. Well, hopefully we can get to that conversation. That is, there's still a, 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 a debate and everything else that's going on within, uh, um, uh, within what, we're, uh, what we're talking about. Uh, and we're, we haven't gotten all the way to the other side of, uh, uh, of the discussion where control is completely in, in one particular hand. Uh, so we, we hope that's the case. But there, there are worries uh, uh, clearly in your book, the warning signs. Uh, and there were, uh, Hungary, of course, is the, is the, the, the most in, important case of where that happens. Um, um, uh, COVID-19, the coronavirus has, has affected uh, a lot of the countries, although we were talking just before we went online that it hasn't really affected uh, yet, or, or, and hopefully won't, uh, in, in Eastern Europe. But it did allow people to, to, uh, to take political uh, to, to take political measures, and our, how worried should we be about the virus uh, as a excuse for uh, for illiberal leaders to take illiberal actions, as we saw, for example, in Hungary, uh, or are we uh, looking at populist leaders not really being very effective in dealing with this, and therefore opening up political space? How do you how do you see the uh, the political outcome of where so we? It, it's really hard to generalize. Um, I mean, the list of um, authoritarian leaders who've taken advantage of the virus in order to carry out, um, uh, you know, in order to tighten the news, you know, on their country is actually quite long. It's not just Hungary. It includes um, some Central Asian countries. It includes, um, uh, you know, you know, Turkey. It includes, you know, many others. Um, but, you know, the, the virus is very strange. I mean, the, you know, we're still in the middle of the you know, of, of, of beginning to understand it and, and understand what it's going to do. Um, so clearly, for example, for the, at the beginning of the, you know, of the outbreak, um, it did look like a lot of people were putting their faith in the state and people were willing to give up and sacrifice quite a lot of liberty and independence, you know, in exchange for safety because they were scared. And there were all these lockdowns and, uh, you know, in many European countries where people accepted quite draconian um, measures from the government. And, you know, lots of people commented that historically, sometimes once these kinds of measures are imposed, you know, they're never lifted. Um, but it's interesting. I mean, I almost think, I almost feel like as it has gone on, there's been a kind of counter reaction whereby having been locked up and locked down, there's now almost a libertarian push in the opposite direction, which you see um, in a lot of countries. Um, but the second part of your observation is also true. Um, and, and here I think the, the story returns to this question of trust um, and the politicians who come to power by undermining trust um, because they seem to be the ones who have done the worst or who've, who've managed the virus the worst in their countries. And so that includes Donald Trump, that includes Bolsonaro in Brazil. Um, you know, to some extent it might include um, uh, Putin in Russia. Um, it's, it, you know, in the countries where people don't trust the authorities, where um, faith in the bureaucracy is very low, where faith in science is very low, where um, where the bureaucracy doesn't function well, which is which is another um, problem in the United States. Um, you know, in countries like that, and this is this is invariably countries run by populists who've who've run um, campaigns against their own states um, and against their own systems. Um, it's been very hard to convince people to make the behavioral changes that are needed in order to uh, keep the virus under control. So, you know, I, I, I agree with your question. You know, it's not a it's not an accident that both Trump and Bolsonaro have 
have had a lot of trouble controlling the virus because they're both people who don't like to listen to experts, who don't want to hear, you know, bad news from scientists, um, and who don't like, you know, whose whose whole modus operandi is about undermining legitimate, trustworthy sources of information, um, which they need to do in order to peddle the conspiracy theories that have brought them to power. So, you know, that was a, that, you know, there, there, there are a lot of different answers to this. And I think as the, as we go on in the system, I think we'll find, you know, a lot of variation in what happens in, in different countries. Uh, let me remind our, our listeners and those watching uh, that they too can, can uh, you can uh, be part of this conversation. Go to ccga.live, that's ccga.live. Uh, type in your question and I'll get to it in uh, just a few moments. Um, uh, are we in an era in which we are seeing a real competition between uh, liberal democracy and authoritarianism at a, at a more global scale. If you go back to 1989, so take take 10 years before your party, uh, the, the the wave of democratization. I think it was the, the third uh, democratic wave. Sam, Samuel Huntington uh, talked about uh, was was sweeping the globe. Since then, we've seen a counter reaction both within our democracies and among authoritarian states, Russia, China, Saudi Arabia, Turkey, becoming more and more uh, authoritarian and offering themselves as a, as a more uh, effective, more capable model to, uh, to democracy. Should we think about what is happening inside the societies that you're, that you're uh, been talking about as something that's happening globally, that we have a real competition between uh, democracy and authoritarianism and it isn't very clear yet who's going to come out on top? So, Certainly there is a real competition and some of the authoritarians have been dedicating themselves to pursuing this competition for some years now, even before we noticed that that's what they were doing. I mean, I do think that the, um, you know, the Russian state has set itself up, or I should say the Kremlin, not because this is not true of all Russians, the Kremlin has constructed a sort of worldview whereby um, its main goal is to show its people constantly how democracy has failed and how authoritarianism has succeeded, and also has set itself as a set of foreign policy goals, the undermining of the democratic and Western clubs and institutions. Um, you know, the European Union, NATO, um, you know, the, the democratic systems in, in, in particular European countries, um, the Russians have supported through disinformation campaigns or sometimes through money and, and other kinds of support, um, anti-Western, anti-European, you know, anti-NATO, anti-American political parties all over Europe. Um, and so they have been pursuing a strategy that's designed to undermine democracy for, you know, for I would say at least a decade. Um, it's only recently that we noticed that they were doing this, but it is, it is certainly the way that they think. Um, and then I think increasingly, yes, I think increasingly the Chinese also see us as I, not just kind of economic competitors, but really ideological competitors and vice versa. Um, and so I do think we are moving into a world where there are different kinds of authoritarianism that are posing themselves as seeking to gain allies, seeking to po you know, present themselves as an alternative to liberal democracy, as more efficient than liberal democracy, or, or, or as, you know, in other ways, better or as appealing to leaders of authoritarian states. Um, China's offering its um, it's um, some of its internet control technology to other countries, um, some of its AI capabilities to other countries to help other authoritarian leaders um, stay in power. So, I mean, there's absolutely a competition going on, even if Americans don't always want to know that. I mean, having said that, you know, returning to your previous question about the virus, um, one of the interesting things about the way the world has divided in terms of, so far at least, who's done well and who's done badly over the virus, is that it's had very little to do with who is a democracy and who is a dictatorship, and everything to do with who had, an, as I say, who had an efficient bureaucracy and whose political system created feelings of trust. So who did well? You know, it was Germany, South Korea, Taiwan, you know who did badly, the United States and Brazil. I mean, those are all democracies. Um, so, you know, so the, you know, what the success of states may, you know, may have, may be related to other things, but, but you know, agreed there is, an, there is an ideological competition going on and I think it's going to grow, will grow more intense in the coming years. 
Let me go to the, some of the questions on, on online. And uh, first one I have is here, how will the rise of, and, and you, you hinted at that in a minute ago already, uh, how will the rise of illiberal democracies in the West impact the relevance and effectiveness of international organizations like NATO and the European Union? So very often, um, in, in sort of so-called liberal democracies are very often led by authoritarian nationalists who by definition don't like international institutions because those institutions can can curb their power or can question some of the things that they're doing um, particularly the democratic clubs that like the European Union that have rules about um, you know about you know how the independence of, of the judiciary for example or, or free press um, so yes, I do think they will increasingly come into, into, they will clash with those institutions. I mean, it's happening all the time. Um, how that will come out is unclear. There, there are beginning to be voices inside Europe saying we should throw out countries that aren't democracies from Europe. Um, and then there are others who are pragmatic who say, no, we should keep people inside the tent and continue the argument. So I don't, I, you know, I can't, I can't give you a prediction right now of how it will turn out. But yes, I do think um, that, you know, the nationalists will clash with international organizations because by definition, um, they have different interests. Uh, and just pushing a little further, I mean, we do this, this issue became a big issue in the uh, negotiations for the new budget uh, that the European Union just uh, after four and a half days concluded, in which the question of adherence to the rule of law specifically uh, Hungary and Poland being uh, seen as the, as the key targets of that, was a key issue uh, on whether or not the European Union would use the political muscle that it had or its economic muscle uh, to try to get these countries to align. And yet that didn't quite seem to come out in the way. It's a little, it's a little uh, unclear how it, how it came out, but, but do you think these organizations can fight back and can become effective tools to deal with countries that are taking a liberal authoritarian nationalist bent away from uh, where the organization uh, is and has been. So certainly, the, so the, what the European Union essentially did was it kicked the question down the road a little bit. There are now some conditionality mechanisms inside the, inside the agreements that say they can, you know, I don't know, not distribute some kinds of money if they believe it's going to be abused. But, um, but it's, not, it's not entirely clear yet how that will work. Um, you know, the problem is I think that most of these organizations weren't really set up to do this. Um, certainly NATO was not. You know, NATO has had non-democracies as its members in the past um, and will probably go on doing so in the future. I mean, NATO faces, I think, some deeper challenges down the road about if it's not a democratic, you know, if it's no longer a club of democracies or would-be democracies, then what is it? Um, and that's a that's a separate question. But even the European Union, which does require its members to be democratic, doesn't have a mechanism in its treaty to kick people out. Or it doesn't, you know, when the when the when it was founded, it you know it wasn't it was assumed that everybody inside the club would remain democratic, and the idea that some states would cease to be didn't come out. I mean, I I, I think. Um, you know, I think down the road, this will grow as an issue. And in particular, it will grow because, because the European Union shares, um, you, know, the, you know, these nations share so much because they share a single market. Um, I mean, if, for example, in Poland, people no longer feel that the judiciary is independent, that will cause trouble, not just for Poles, but for European companies and businesses and people who are working in Poland and who need you know, who need to rely on the court system as well. Um, and it, it may be that it will be, the clash will come, you know, when there's an irresolvable case or when, um, when um, uh, you know, when, when, you know, when, when the, the market itself falls apart. I mean, I, I think we're still, the, the, the real clashes are still to come and they, um, they may be quite unpleasant. Um. Uh, some opinion polls have uh, suggested that the younger generations in our democracies are less uh, supportive of uh, democracy or less worried uh, about its disappearance than others. Are, is that something you, you see a generational issue here uh, that may be emerging or you think that is over uh, overblown? In fact, that the future, you, in fact, you end your, your book with another party in 2019 when you 
uh, uh, where the younger generation is part of it, you uh, you have a slightly you know it's a more, a more positive view in the sense that things uh, seem from that generational perspective to move in the right direction. How do you see the, the generations play out? So I'll answer that question in two ways. First of all, I think it's very irresponsible to be a pessimist, even though I kind of I naturally am one. I sort of instinctively pessimistic. I've spent a lot of my life writing books about awful things. I mean, it's just, you know, it's part of the, it's kind of par for the course, but it's irresponsible because it's unfair to younger people whose lives are still ahead of them and who want to create something and who want to feel optimistic about the future. Um, and there are a lot of really, you know, I, I, I know in my children's generation, in students that I've taught, in, you know, other younger people that I run across now and, you know, professionally, um, there are so many talented um, younger people out there who, I, you know, who could very well, um, you know, improve the world and I want them to do it. I don't want to cast a pall over their efforts. I mean, I do think that there is a generational change in that, I mean, um, you know, we are now, you know, the people who are now coming up into adulthood are now people who not only don't remember the Second World War, which, you know, you and I don't remember, but don't remember the Cold War. Um, and so don't remember what were the themes and unifying causes that once held the West together, that once made democracy seem like the obvious um, political system. Um, and, you know, it may be that those, because they don't remember that themselves, that um, they, they don't find the shattering of it or the breaking apart of it as traumatic as we do. Um, and it may be that they need, they will have to, you know, uh, you know, if there is going to be another confrontation or another kind of competition between democracy and autocracy, it may be that they have to discover, rediscover some of those values for themselves. Um, so, so I would say that. Um, I, I, yeah, I, I would say I would say that they there is a generational change, and I hope that it doesn't mean um, you know that, that it's not going to be bad for our system, but that it will re rejuvenate it. Well, I mean, clearly the uh, sort of the people in their twenties and uh, their experience very different from ours. They went through nine eleven, two failed wars, and uh, and now two economic crises. Uh, and uh, and a pandemic that in some places hasn't been held well. So it's it's not that surprising if they were to say, I'm not sure whether this system is really working for me uh, in that way. But you're right, we should all be optimistic. And and, and I'll ask my pessimistic question at the very end uh, to to get it. One one of the questions that, uh, that is being asked is with regards to a, a uh, op-ed by Gary Hart uh, in the New York Times today, uh, where he says there are newly discovered documents that authorize extraordinary presidential powers in the case of a national emergency. Um, the question is, is whether we should hold hearings, uh, but I, I actually want to push it in a slightly different direction. The more than happy for you to answer that. How worried should we be that in a democracy, uh, executives have extraordinary power and if they if the norms get shattered about how that power is used, that, that, that in fact you very quickly can mis abuse power. We see it in, in certain ways what's happening in federal policing, um, but a whole variety of other ways. How worried should we be about those kinds of issues in the United States or frankly in other parts uh, of the countries that you've, uh, that you've looked at? Uh, the, the, the misuse of power and, uh, and in fact the, the, the walking away from democratic norms. So our constitution was set up by men who were worried that the president would abuse his power. I mean, that was one of the prime concerns of the people who wrote it. Um, and although it's a little creaky now, and there are some elements from the 18th century that maybe we should think about um, looking at again, it is, you know, one of the one of the you know central advantages of the U.S. Constitution, as opposed to some others, is that it does put in place these um, checks and balances that are supposed to restrain executive power for exactly that reason. So that the president is not a king, um, the president is not exempt from investigation, um, the president is meant to be blocked and checked by Congress and by the courts. Um, and actually, we've seen even in recent days that the courts do check the president and can check the president. Um, and, you know, that's been a, um, so in that sense, not all norms have been broken. Um, I think the unexpected element of the last couple of years has been the degree to which Congress, um, and in particular the Republican Senate, 
have refused to check the president even when he has indulged in or engaged in some very obvious abuses of power. Um, you know, you know if, if you just look, if you turn, um, turn back and remember what the impeachment hearings were about, um, that was about the president abusing the tools of American foreign policy, so American military aid to a foreign country, um, in order to blackmail a foreign government to launch a fake investigation of his political opponent. Um, it's kind of unprecedented way for an American president to treat you know, taxpayers' money, and mo again, money that was meant to be used for a foreign policy cause um, for personal gain or personal use. Um, and yet, you know, the, the, the Senate, the Republicans in the Senate did not see fit um, even to hold hearings um, about, about whether, that was, um, whether that was illegal or improper or immoral or, or unconstitutional. Um, and so in that sense, we, you know, if, if there has been a failure um, in the constitutional system, it, the failure lies somewhere um, in the Republican Party. And, you know, I speak as, you know, I voted Republican for many years. You can call me an ex-conservative. Um, I haven't been a conservative recently, it's true. Um, but, but I think the, um, you know, what's happened to the Republican Party and what's happened to the, it's, it's leadership. And I mean, I mean, at the very highest level, I'm not talking about all Republicans or all voters or all conservatives. Um, um, I still think there's an absolutely legitimate and important role for conservative thinkers and, and voters in, in American politics, absolutely. But there is something that has happened at the very highest end of the Republican Party that is, that is worrying. Um, and that is what I think has allowed this abuse of executive power. Um, to take place, and I'm I'm hoping that voters will notice this and react to it in the in the fall. Um, uh, a question that that got asked leads me to to observe uh, something that you wrote in the book. You met with a uh, uh, a Greek um, historian who uh, I believe and I don't, know, don't quote me on it correct uh, exactly, but I think said something like the exception was the liberalism in a period rather than the, the authoritarianism that we're seeing now. So a question uh, it being asked here is, is um, do you think that it's possible that authoritarianism will always be with us in a tug of war with liberalism? Or is there a histor history, historical teleology of progress uh, you see, is the end of history still a possibility? Uh, it put it in Frank Fukuyama's terms, or do you think this struggle will always go on? And in fact, uh, more times than not, uh, liberalism may be on the losing end of that struggle. So I think that one of the great mistakes we've all made over the last several decades, and I say this in the book, is to imagine that American history is a story of constant progress. Because if it's a story of constant progress and everything is always going to, you know, get better or at least, you know, be fine more or less, then we don't have to worry about it, right? And we don't have to put any effort into making sure that our democracy is healthy and making sure that it, it's still functional. Um, I mean, look, history is circular. It is not a story of progress. Um, you know, the human race has gone forwards and backwards. Um, um, many democracies have fallen apart and become dictatorships. In fact, most of them have um, throughout history. Um, and they have done so in recent memory. Um, so, uh, you know, Venezuela is a, is a, is a recent one, um, but you, you don't have to go back to the 1930s as many people do to, to, to talk about it. Um, so, um, you know, so I would urge people not to think like that and to always keep in the front of your brain the, the, the possibility that we could lose our democracy and that therefore um, we all need to remain engaged in it and concerned about it and um, aware that, you know, it's in some ways it hasn't met the challenges of the present. Um, and I, that's part of the purpose of writing this book was to remind people of that. You know, America is in that sense, not an exception. You know, you know, democracy has ended in other places. Authoritarian political movements have succeeded in other places. Um, they could succeed here too. You're muted. With, with that sobering uh, statement, uh, Anne, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, we've been talking about Anne Applebaum's uh, latest great book, Twilight of Democracy, The Seductive Lure of Authoritarianism. You can buy it uh, at our local books uh, seller by uh, either uh, clicking on the link in the chat function or going to our website. Anne, thanks so much for being with us. It's wonderful to have you. I hope that we will continue to 
come have you back in Chicago next time in person on your next book, which uh, uh, will lay out how liberalism triumphed over <laughs> uh, over the lure, the seductive lure of authoritarianism. Anne Applebaum, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you, thank you, and everybody, you support your local bookstores. Thanks. Well, appreciate it. Take care. Bye bye.